life. And so if you look with me uh, at Matthew uh, chapter 5, verses 38 through 48, living the ideal life. Follow along with me if you want to in your copy of God's Word or on the screen uh, behind me. You have heard it that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You've heard it was said, you should love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be, the son, so you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Lord Jesus, we bow before your throne today, realizing that every single word in your book is true and right and good. But Father, when we read your word, sometimes we have questions. Questions about how do we do this? How do we put this into our lives? How do we live out our lives for your glory? And Father, I ask you today that your spirit would just consume us, work in our hearts, change us and make us the people you want us to be. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. It's been said that few passages of scripture summarize Christians' ethics more succinctly or directly than this passage we're looking at today. It also could be said that few passages may be misunderstood. You know, you see there are recognizable phrases. Turn the other cheek, go the second mile, love your enemies. Now, the slide I have up there may be what the world thinks. You see, if someone throws you a stone or throws, throws a stone at you, throw a flower at them. Now, that might be nice. But then it goes on and says, but remember, throw the pot as well. And you see, a lot of people are familiar with the, the idea of turn the other cheek, Go the extra mile, love your enemies. But how does that apply to us today? Almost 2,000 years after they were spoken. Though Jesus is referring to the laws and customs that were specific at his time and culture, the words I think directly apply to us today in our time, in our culture, in the 21st century. Because the desire for revenge is as much an issue today as it ever has been. You see, when someone does you wrong, when someone takes advantage of you or bullies you, what do you want to do? You want to get even, don't you? And as we look at the passage, I want to begin by trying to take a look, closer look at some statements that Jesus made that may be misinterpreted. So first of all, let me just look at this one. If you look at verse 38 and 39, look at this one. You have heard it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other cheek. Let me ask you this. What does it mean to return an eye for an eye? You see, the principle is this punishment must fit the crime. And there must be just penalty for evil actions. This passage comes from Exodus chapter 21. So what I would say is that this, 
The message that Jesus is saying to us is that justice should be equitable. Excessive harshness and excessive leniency should be avoided. There is no indication that an eye for an eye was followed literally. And there is never a biblical account of an Israelite being maimed as a result of the law. Also, before this particular law was given, God had already established a judicial system to determine penalties. A system that would be unnecessary if God had literally intended an eye for an eye. Although capital crimes were paid with an execution, other crimes were repaid in goods. If you injured a man's hand so that he couldn't work, you compensated that man for his lost wages. In the New Testament, it went like this. It seemed that the Pharisees and the scribes were taking the eye-for-eye eye principle and applying it to everyday relationships. They thought, they taught that seeking personal re revenge was acceptable. That what they did was, is they confused public discipline or public judicial system with their own personal vendettas. You see, rather than separating the responsibility of the government and of our responsibility on the personal level to love our enemies, they said that we should do it all the same. There was a distinction here. And that's what Jesus is getting at. Now, if you look at the next slide, does that mean that we should be completely passive? Now, an eye for an eye will not make the whole world pirates. You see, that was not God's intention. God's intention in the next slide is that we don't become doormats. Right? It's not meant that we should be walked on all the time. It doesn't mean that we should do nothing to protect our lives or stand up for our lives or children. Do you remember when Jesus was at the, at the, at the um, demanded the rights? Is it, when Jesus, excuse me, demanded, drove the money changers out of the temple? Do you remember that? He wasn't passive. Do you remember when Paul demanded his rights as a Roman citizen, uh, demanding a trial in, in Acts chapter 16? Do you remember when Jesus and Paul confronted unbelievers or confronted believers with their sin? In the context, the next slide shows you this. The word resist means retaliate. Now, now we like to retaliate. Here someone wants to blow up somebody else, right? He, he wants to get back at him and the person's running away. And that's what we have kind of in our hearts and our minds. We want to get back at some people sometimes. Jesus is talking about revenge, not self-preservation. Jesus is not telling us to be weak and passive. He's telling us not to be vindictive. Another statement that is misapplied is found in verse 42. It says, give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Now, let me ask you this. Does this mean that a Christian banker can never refuse a loan application? No matter what? The answer is no. Does this mean if, that you have to loan money to everybody who asks you even though you know the person will never pay you back? No. Does that mean that you have to give money to every panhandler on the street every time you see one? No. Because this commandment doesn't relieve you of the obligation to manage your resources properly. It is... You need, to, you need to practice generosity for sure, but you also need to practice discernment. Jesus also said another difficult passage, one of the hardest passages in the Bible to understand. It says, you therefore must be what? Perfect as your heavenly Father is what? Perfect. Now, does that sound possible? It doesn't, does it? Now, while Jesus commands us to do things Sometimes he commands us to do things that sometimes we're not capable of doing. He commands us with the moral ability sometimes to obey him. For instance, look at the Ten Commandments. What was the purpose of the Ten Commandments? Can anybody obey the Ten Commandments fully? The answer is no. No one can obey the Ten Commandments completely and fully. Everybody falls short. But does that mean God doesn't command us to obey all of them? 
He commands us to do it all, doesn't he? Just because we can't and we can't live up to the God's ideal doesn't mean that we don't have a moral obligation to do so. We have a moral obligation to do so. In fact, the Ten Commandments or the law of God reveals what about our lives? Our sin, doesn't it? God's law reveals our sin. If we loved him with all of our heart and obeyed all of his commands, you know, we could theoretically save ourselves, couldn't we? And we would have no need of a savior. But our need for a savior is due to the fact that none of us is able to obey God's commands. That is because we are morally incapable of doing so. So, basically, what he's saying there, God's commands do this. They show us our spiritual bankruptcy. They show us that we can't, by our own strength, do what God says. We need help, don't we? That means you need a Savior. Do you realize that? You need a Savior. I need a Savior. We need a Savior. Because none of us is going to be able to do all that God commands us to do. So when he says be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect, that's the command, that's the goal, that's what he does. Now, it would be like this. Suppose a venture capitalist decided to give a businessman one billion dollars. That's pretty good, isn't it? This businessman had had several successful businesses. But when he received the billion dollars, the man decided to go to Las Vegas and he lost all of his billion dollars and he lost all of his money and he comes back now does that man have the ability to pay back the billion dollars the answer is what no but is he morally obligated to the answer is yes the answer is yes so when God sets the standard beyond us, we're still morally obligated to be what God wants us to be, to do what God wants us to do, even though we don't have it in ourselves to do it. What that means for you and for me is that we have to look to someone else to do it for us, don't we? And that person's name is Jesus. Jesus is the one who's done it for us. Jesus, when he lived in this world, lived perfectly without sin. He lived every day for the glory and majesty of God. He was perfect in every way. That's our Savior. That's who we rejoice. That's who we sing about. That's who we get excited about. That's who, who is our, 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 our love, is Jesus. And I love him. But I love him so little. If we looked at our hearts, we'd say, you know what? There are other things that compete for the love of Jesus in our hearts, doesn't it? Oh, oh, if we would only know the, the glory, the joy, the passion, the, the, the experience of loving Jesus with every fiber of our being. And sometimes we've got a glimpse of that. You see... In the context of this passage, perfect means also brought to completion, full grown, lacking nothing, mature. Jesus is saying to his people of the day and to us now that we should not be satisfied with halfway obedience. See, Jesus had a purpose and he can fulfill a purpose in our lives. You know, God's purpose is illustrated in several verses. Romans 5 verse 8 says this. But God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It doesn't say this. But God shows his love for us that while we were perfect, Christ died for us, does it? It doesn't say that what God showed, showed us his love for us that while we were beneficial to God, he died for us. It says while we were still sinners. And as sinners, and I am a sinner, I needed God's love. If you need God's love and forgiveness, you've got to admit that you're a sinner. There's no other way about it, isn't there? We have to admit there is sin and it separates us from God. 
But even though we were going the other way, we were saying, God, no thank you. You know what God did? He loved us. That's an amazing thing about God's love. You could have sinned and sinned. And you know what God is doing? He is loving you and loving you and pursuing you. And he's inviting you into a relationship with himself. John said, in 1 John 4.19, he says, We love because he first loved us. God doesn't love us because we love him. We love because he has loved us us it's all about living the ideal life the ideal life and that's what we're going to talk about today how can we deal and live this ideal life here are four things that you can do to show your love for your enemies and live the ideal life first of all live the ideal life by not responding to insults Look at verse 39. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if any of you slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him, turn to him the other also. Now, I don't know about you, but if someone slaps me, that might hurt, right? It's like this right here. When someone slaps you, that, that can be painful. But one of the things people say, if you turn the other cheek... Most people, if they were right-handed, would slap this way, but if they slapped with their back hand, kind of like a, you, you all play tennis? You, you, you slap with the back hand? That was an ultimate insult. It was an insult to slap someone in the front, but with their palm of their hand, but it was an insult, a huge insult to back, backhand somebody. Like my mom, was, my mom would always, my grandma actually was always saying, I'm going to backhand you one day. That was an insult. You see, um, now, I, I never watched Seinfeld that much. Anybody wa ever watch Seinfeld? Uh, there was a man, I, I, I see it on YouTube. So I find things on YouTube. I can watch it on YouTube. But uh, there, was, there was a show where, where uh, one of the characters on that show was named George Constanza. I think that's him right there, in fact. Uh, he was insulted by a coworker during an office meeting. And so what he did was he started planning his revenge. He was going to get back. And so the next meeting came around and he was ready to get back. But you know what happened? The co-worker had left the company and moved to Ohio. Well, you know what he did? He flew to Ohio, got with that company that the co-worker was with, wanted to make a presentation to that company so he could get a zinger back at this guy who had insulted him. And you know what happened after that? The other guy had a better zinger back at him. <laughs> you, you see, we don't need to respond to his insults. It's never good, does it? Does insulting people make you feel better? Does it ever solve your problems? Does it ever take away the hurt? In fact, the longer you hold to an idea of retaliation, the more the insult hurts you. A couple of years ago, uh, Fuzzy Zeller and Tiger Woods were playing and, and uh, Fuzzy made an inappropriate remark. It was mean-spirited. Now, now, Tiger isn't known, I don't think, for his magnanimous, kind attitude. But, but at this time, I think he responded perfectly. Tiger was insulted, but you know what he said? We all make mistakes. Let's move on. We all make mistakes. You know, he could have returned insult for insult. I mean, I, I look at the... News today, and it, it, it's one person insulting another person, isn't it? This person insulting that person, this person insulting that person. Let me tell you, you don't need to return insult for insult. Solomon says in Proverbs 12, 16, the vexation of a fool is known at once, but listen to this, but the prudent ignores an insult. The Apostle Paul, Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, do not... 
or evil or but on the contrary, bless. For this is what you were called that you may obtain a blessing. When you are insulted, you could waste a lot of energy thinking about how you can get back. Not worth it. Love your enemies. Number two, and I need to go. Live the ideal life by doing more than is required of you. It says in verse 40, <coughs> and if anyone sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. Now, it was a common practice in that day, it was a common practice, that if someone, you were going to give collateral for a loan, you would give someone the shirt that you were wearing. You wouldn't give them your coat, especially today, right? You would give them, because you had multiple shirts, didn't you? People had multiple, but you only had one coat, and in that culture, your coat was also your blanket. Exodus chapter 22, verses 26 and 27 says this, if ever you take your neighbor's cloak in pledge, you shall return it to him before the sun goes down. For that is his only covering, and it is his cloak for his body. In what else shall, shall he sleep? So the Bible's very clear that in the Old Testament times, when you had a coat, you had one coat, and that was not only your coat for the day, guess what? That was your blanket for the night. And the only way a man could take your tunic from you was if he had pledged, you had pledged your tunic as a security for debt and you hadn't paid your debt. So let's make sure that we read the words of Jesus correctly. He is saying, if you have a debt and you haven't paid and you get sued as a result, do more than is legally required to make your debt right. George S. Patton said this, he says, always, always do more than is required of you. Always do more. Ideally, a suit would, would never be necessary. A man would pledge his tunic as security on a debt and he would pay the debt, but it would, when it came due, the lien would be released. But Jesus says, if you mess up in the process and someone has to sue you to get what's coming to them, you need to go out of your way to make it right. Remember Zacchaeus? We all know that little song about Zacchaeus and climbing up the tree and everything like that. But you know what he said in, in Luke chapter 9, verse 18, he says this. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half my goods I have given to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will restore it fourfold. Fourfold. You see, we should, in an ideal life, in an ideal life, do more than is required of us to make things right. It's the ideal life. Number three, the ideal life is, is, is lived by treating mistreaters with kindness. Live the ideal life by mistreating mistreaters with kindness. It says here, in verse 41 of chapter 5 of Matthew, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him, what? Two miles. In that culture, in that day, a Roman soldier, if, if you saw a Roman soldier on the side of the street, you know what he could make you do? He could make you carry his pack for one mile. And that was an obvious nuisance, wouldn't it be? Uh, suppose someone, you were, you were late to an appointment and, and, and you were walking down the street, you didn't have a car and no one had a car at that time, you're walking down the street and you saw a, ro a soldier and they would say, hey, you need to carry my backpack. What would you say? You would kind of go, well, I'm late, right? And, and it would be a nuisance. But what Jesus is saying, listen, when someone asks you to do that, do it, show God's love and go that extra mile. Go that mile too. Do more. And treat mistreaters with kindness. Don't calculate the very least you have to do. Calculate more than that, but treat them with kindness. Let me ask you this. In work, do you, are bosses ever bullies? And is the company you work for oppressive? And at times, do you feel like that they're just using you? Now, of course, that's not the case, right? But it may seem that way. When that happens and you feel like 
someone's taking advantage of you, go the second mile. Give to them. Don't take from them. Live your life selflessly, is what Jesus is saying. Don't demand that, hey, wait a minute, I need to do this or I need to do that. Think about them and show God's love to them. And finally, live the ideal life. The final thing here, live the ideal life by not showing favorites. Not showing favorites. He says in verse 42, give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. It's interesting that Jesus included this verse along with the verses that talk about how we should treat our enemies. He did it because in this context in which we need to hear it. Most of us are more than willing to give something to our friends. But that's not enough. Jesus is saying, don't be generous with your friends, but help everyone you can. Now, Mark McCormick wrote a book many years ago called What They Don't Teach You in Harvard Business School. He said this, all things being equal, people buy from friends. All things being unequal, people still buy from friends. For this reason, you want to make as many friends as you can. That was his business advice. That's the way it works in the business world most of the time. But Jesus is challenging his followers to go beyond that attitude. To be generous with people we like as well as the people that we what? Don't like. The principle applies to more than money. It applies to how you treat people in every area of your life. You may find at times that you have an opportunity to help somebody that's not part of your group or clique. Help them. Someone may have been unfriendly to you. Still help them. Remember, Jesus is not commanding us to be irresponsible with our resources. He is commanding us not to be stingy and not to hold back when we have the power to help. Be generous. Be generous. See, the ideal life is lived by not res responding to insults. It's lived by doing more than is required of you to make things right. It's treating people who have mistreated you with kindness and not showing favoritism. Verse 43 through 45 in Matthew chapter 5 says this. You've heard it was said you should love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who, what? Persecute you. So that you may be sons of your father who's in heaven. For he makes the sun, what? Rise on the evil and on the good and sends rains on the just and the unjust. You see, God is practicing that principle right now. Remember, it was God who first loved us. Remember before you came to Jesus Christ, before you were a believer in Jesus Christ, did the sun come up on you every day? Did the rains fall upon you for blessing? They did, didn't they? Every single day, God has loved. Every single day, God has done more than, than we can imagine to bless us and strengthen us. The phrase sons of your father is an idiom that means you will be like your father in heaven if you do this. If you love your enemies. Not just get along with them. Love them. You are never more like your heavenly father and you're never more living the ideal life than when you love those who don't love you. When you refuse to retaliate. You're living the ideal life when you seek to make restitution for wrong, when you respond to mistreatment and kindness, and when you extend generosity to all who need it. That's how you live an ideal life. And it can be summed up in one word. Love. Love. Love other people, but love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And you realize you can't do that without Jesus. You can't do that without a relationship with Jesus Christ. And Jesus invites you today to come. To come and believe and be forgiven of your sins. Heavenly Father, I thank you today for the 